All right, please uh, kick it off when you, when you are ready. Welcome formally, everyone, to datamanagementu.com's webinar series. This is our first case study, as I've mentioned. We have case studies on a variety of topics. And today, we are honored to present our first case study on a data management topic, specifically on data governance. Datamanagementu.com is pleased to present this, and we are thrilled to be sponsored by EW Solutions. We have other sponsors we will mention shortly. Questions and answers. If you have a question to pose to Amber and Kimberly, please pose them in the Q&A. Do not pose them in chat. We have a chat session open if people want discussion, but questions and answers should be posed in the Q&A section because we will monitor that closely. For everyone who's interested in learning more about data governance, metadata management, and the fundamentals of enterprise data management, we have courses at datamanagementeducation.com. If you're on social media, please follow Data Management U, especially on LinkedIn, where we post updates regularly. As David and I mentioned, we are streaming live to YouTube, and the session will be available for view at the end of the webinar. If you want a copy of the presentation, it's on the EW Solutions Data Management U website under webinars. And if you stick around for the entire session, one hour, you will receive a certificate for a professional development unit that you can apply to many existing certifications. Now, the certificates are sent out within about a week, 10 days at the most. Please do not email us this afternoon asking where's your certificate. That is said with a very loving grin. I'd like to thank our partner organizations and our sponsors. IAMAfrica.org, IDMA.org, IAIABC.org. We are proud to have them as partner organizations. Our sponsors make this possible. EW Solutions, Octopi, and OneTrust are our sponsors for today's webinar. If your organization would like to consider becoming a sponsor, please let us know. What about today's webinar? Why am I sitting here? Well, the title really gives us a view of what we're going to learn about. We're going to learn about a data governance framework developed and implemented by the state of Tennessee. Eight crucial elements in that framework. We'll look at the framework overview. We'll look at the challenges that they have faced, the obstacles they've overcome, and the issues they've resolved. We'll learn about the results they've been able to achieve at this point with key lessons they've learned. We will take questions and answers during the session. As your moderator, I will be monitoring the question and answers, and we'll answer some of them live. We'll ask Kim and Amber to do that, or we will answer them via responses in Q&A. So please stay tuned. Up next, our presenters, Kimberly Weinzerl, who is the Chief Data Officer for the State of Tennessee. Before that, she was the Data Director at Pekin Insurance and the EIM manager at Caterpillar. Amber is the director of data governance for the state of Tennessee. She's the first to serve in that role. And it's her responsibility to ensure that this is rolled out across the entire state. Welcome, Kim and Amber. And again, thank you very much for joining us today. I will stop sharing and turn it over to Kim, who will then start sharing the presentation. All to you, Kim and Amber. Great, thank you so much, uh, Anne-Marie um, and David for having us here today. Um, I hope we don't disappoint. That was a gigantic intro with this riveting story, but uh, it is pretty cool. Um, and we do have uh, 
some successes to share uh, with you uh, with what's happening with the state of Tennessee. Um, so the way this, that we're gonna operate this, I'm going to cover a few slides. Me and Amber will kind of go in between on slides, um, but please have your uh, questions coming in through the Q&A and we'll answer those as Anne-Marie presents those to us. Okay, so introduction. Um, I started as the chief data officer for the state back in June. Um, and like with any other you know, new job you get, you kind of get the lay of the land, you go learn from um, your customer base exactly what is happening uh, that pertains to your job. So uh, <clears throat> when I started, I did a series of data strategy workshops across the various state agencies being things like the ones listed here, um, Department of Human Services, Labor Workforce Development, Education, Child Services. Um, and in doing that, um, the plan was I would gather enough information about data gaps, data concerns, data sharing, data privacy to kind of feed into a, a statewide um, data strategy for Tennessee. In doing that, every single workshop session uh, the first thing that came up was data governance. Like we need a common process. We're, we're all doing it, but none of us are doing it. Um, we can't communicate across agencies because we're doing it different ways. Um, when we have audits, internal or external, you know, it's a small project to be able to respond to them when, when you're talking about data governance. So um, I kind of put um, authoring the strategy on hold, which it's now done. Um, but we just started with data governance. So what we're gonna share with you today is called the eight elements of data governance. I have used the same uh, technique methodology um, at both Caterpillar, at Peak and Insurance, and now at the state of Tennessee. So the slide you're looking at here, um, after we um, crafted the eight elements, make sure it was the right fit, had the right contents for um, a new industry of government. Um, and for where the state of Tennessee already was with their data governance processes, we piloted that framework. So what we piloted it with was a data set called P20. Um, if you are in the government sector, you probably know what that is, but this is known as the Statewide Longitudinal Data System, SLDS is the acronym. Um, and basically what it does is it collects data, you know, states have to do this, they must collect data um, for K through 12 and post-secondary education, basically tracking students um, and their abilities to succeed in college um, and in the workforce. So um, large uh, data set, um, you'll see here the, the icons of the various um, departments or agencies in the state that participated. Um, and we ran that pilot. One, at the end of this presentation, Amber's going to share with you the results of that pilot, but obviously it was a flaming success because we are now um, rolling it out statewide. So here's the eight elements. Um, the uh, it, it's kind of runs the framework runs across this, you know, start by managing, then get it under control, and then get it to sustain. Um, it's flexible in a way that these all come at different degrees, depending upon where you're already at and the um, you know, uh, degree of governance you may possibly need. Um, across this framework, uh, chances are you're already doing this, <laughs> some of this, maybe all of this, maybe more than this. What this framework does is it kind of streamlines those activities. It puts everybody in the same language um, and it's built for reuse um, and you know, completeness of what we hold important when it comes to doing data governance. So what we're gonna do is now um, step through each one of these boxes uh, in a little more detail. So the very first box is organization. Um, each one of these slides is gonna be laid out very similar. So you've got the box in the middle, you've got suggested inputs and potential outputs off of the slide. Um, at the top, the goals of why, you know, what are you trying to accomplish as you work through this particular element? And then any templates or tools that you may consider uh, using 
um, as you go through this activity. So first boxes organization, um, not that the boxes are in any real particular order, but this one is very important because um, this is where you wanna define the data domain, the scope of it that you're gonna put under governance. Um, you're gonna figure out who's the data owner, who's the data steward, um, you know, who's the data you know, governor. You're going to define the business value and the uses for the data. Like why are we, why do we care about this data so much that we wanna put it under a data governance program? Um, and you're gonna start building that plan for how you're gonna operationalize it. So things coming into this box would be things like your data governance operating uh, model, if you have one, your data strategy, if you have one, and then the outputs are going to be um, roles, responsibilities, um, committees potentially for governing the data, um, documentation around <clears throat> the importance of this data and the high level business need, uh, an action plan if you don't have you know, everything you think you need out of this uh, particular element, you know, and then those, uh, you know, definition of who produces this data, who consumes this data. So some tools you might consider or templates you might consider would be org charts, um, RACI responsibility charts, um, and state of Tennessee, um, we are offering up SMART goals, individual SMART goals for folks that are holding um, some of these data roles officially. Kim. Yes. We have a question. Okay. What happens if you don't have a data governance operating model or a data strategy? What are the inputs to organization? Yeah, then it's gonna be your org charts, um, you know, an understanding of the, the functions that people are serving in the organization already. Okay. Would you recommend that if the organization doesn't have an operating model or a data strategy, that they go back and develop those things before they start this? Um, not required, uh, because <laughs> okay. state of Tennessee, I, uh, you know, we started it without that. So, yeah, any of these inputs and outputs, these are, you know, suggestions, recommendations, but there could be more, there could be less in a lot of them. But the one thing, if I were to share any, like, must have across all eight elements, the one must have comes out of this box, and that's a data owner who understands their role. Um, otherwise, uh, and I've done this in practice, you can get through all eight elements at the end and a new owner arises and you start over. So that is, uh, that's the only rule must have. Okay, box two, um, Amber's gonna share this one. Yeah, and I'll add to the, the first box is just, that one's more about the people. You don't have to have the documentation in place, you need to have the people in place and then the people can help you build the documentation. But. Okay, so the, the second element of data governance is all about data policies. So good data policies are gonna be your foundation for any data governance program. Um, and the goal of a data policy is to provide guidance on how you know we manage data asset over the entire life cycle from when it's input into our systems, when it gets reported on, when it gets deprecated all the way to the very end when we delete it. Um, and some inputs to consider for your policy are going to be on the left, those terms and data definitions, your data naming standards, your business rules, quality standards if they apply, and then of course your information security concerns because you can't talk about data without talking about security. Um, and then a data policy may also authorize and define that data governance program, what we talked about in that first box, any committees and any roles associated with the data. So in the first box, you're like, okay, I think we need all these things. And then you put it in your policy so people can go and see, yes, this is what we've, this is what we've said, so this is what we've laid down. Um, there are usually five key focus areas for data policy development. The first one is authoring, which is when, how, and by whom data may be created, changed, or deleted. Then it's access, which people or systems are authorized to see and get the data. Usage, what are the authorized uses for the data and how are they mapped back to the users? Uh, maintenance, how the data is maintained in the source system and backed up for recovery. And then retention and storage, how long must the data be kept, in what format, and any defined lean times for retrieval if you have archived it. 
Um, so the level of policy definition required will vary depending on the business value and the associated risk uh, assigned by the data owner. So in government, we have such a thing as public data. We're going to have very little policy around public data. It's, it's open, it's public, people can look at it, whatever. But we also might have very protected data, such as uh, health insurance information or, or federal tax information. That kind of stuff is very protected and needs much more higher levels of policy around it because so we can keep it as protected as it needs to be. So a generally a useful template for this one is gonna be a policy template. Usually every organization has ones, just kind of plop down your data policies in your, in your template and move on. Okay, box number three is procedure. So now that you have those policies written, this is the how do you carry out those policies? Um, so this is gonna define how the data will be managed to meet those requirements and ensure that there's responsibility and the steps and tasks are very clear for, for um, executing. So your policies are gonna be input, um, could potentially have some enterprise policies that are input into your procedures. And the output will simply be those, you know, step-by-step -step, uh, procedure documents, the roles uh, and, you know, the standard work behind it. Um, so templates and tools you could use here, again, a procedure template if you have one, um, process swim lane charts like you draw in Visio are, are nice to have. And again, uh, RACI um, would serve well here. So the fourth element of data governance is implementing standards and definitions. Uh, those are usually the guidelines that inform how we de design data solutions, interpret information, evaluate performance, and ensure quality for our data from source to consumer. Uh, so the goals of this data governance are to actually def definitions and standards are documented for all required fields in the data in the in the data set and that safe sources of data are identified definitions literally describe the meaning of the data element in a way that is readily understood by data consumer it's not f underscore name it's first name. So, so a person can understand that. That's that human readable understanding of what it is. And then standards are those documented specifications for what is uh, for a specific data element or sub element. Um, such things as like valid values and acceptable ranges. If it's age, it's going to be between the age of one and 100, basically. You're, so you're not going to get a 1000 out there. A specific formatting rules, no free text fields, minimum data quality levels. This, you know, this must be 93% accurate, that kind of thing. Any determined required fields, first name, last name, usually required fields. Uh, what those safe sources of data are, and then any formulas for creating derived data, if you have those defined. Standards are usually defined from your data models, your data schemas, your data naming rules, and any business rules you have. Um, standards and definitions should be housed in a data dictionary, and this work is typically performed by the data stewards and then reviewed and approved by the data owner. Uh, useful templates and tools are going to be a business glossary, a data dictionary, a metadata repository, and a data model. And at the state, we've, we've implemented the Alation Data Catalog that kind of handles all of this stuff for us. Amber, we have two questions about this. Mm -hmm. One, is a safe source the same thing as an authorized data source? Yes, it's, it's okay. where, you, where you agree that this is the place I get my data, yes. And how did you identify the critical data elements for each source? We have a, we have a whole system. <laughs> okay. uh, we have a whole like template business decision tree that, that helps you workflow that this is, this is critical, this is not critical, but there's, there's a lot of different things that go into that. That's a separate presentation. That's a future I see another presentation in your future. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. And which organization created the data standards and definitions? Did you do it? Did another team do it? Hmm. Mm. Did they just appear magically? Yeah. Usually it's a, it's a committee decision, if that makes sense. Uh, so mm -hmm. a team will submit it and then the data governance committee will approve it or, or whatnot, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for letting me interrupt with the questions. Okay, box number five is architecture. Uh, this really has two parts to it. Um, when we say architecture, we do mean the technology architecture or the technical architecture, but we also mean the business architecture. So um, out of this box, you're going to, you know, create those reference architectures that show, you know, how your data is moving across the various um, servers and databases and tables. Um, 
You're also going to, um, you know, potentially create your data models for others to consume. Um, your data flow diagrams would be part of that. Um, those are kind of the technical piece parts, but there's also business processes. So um, from the business user's eyes, how is this data flowing through what systems off of what keyboards? Um, so inputs into this, again, um, feeding in those roles and responsibilities, make sure you include everybody that's uh, involved. Um, talk a little bit more about the high level business need uh, for the data. Um, You'll bring in the, you know, your standard methodologies and tools and, you know, data platform type information uh, would come into there. Uh, outputs, like I said, data <coughs> model, uh, maybe a data category chart or also called a data domain chart. Um, your identification of your key or critical data elements would happen here. Um, and all of that's gonna align to that business process flow and the actors that are within that business process flow. So ideas for templates and tools, uh, again, swim lane uh, map is always good. Um, data models, if you, you know, produce those out of any uh, given data modeling software, um, as well as data flow diagrams, um, and then a system reference architecture diagram. One of the things that David just pointed out in chat is like standards, for example, ISO 3166 are excellent for organizations to start with when they develop data standards. Did you use any ISO standards? Uh, we referenced them uh, in the beginning. It seems like a lot of folks already had working knowledge of them. <laughs> so like, like we used them, but not directly uh, because we are already fully aware. Good. Um, as far as architecture go, we are using TOGAF uh, standards uh, for that. Okay. So the sixth element of data governance is the data administration and controls. This is that tie into enterprise security. Um, this phase defines who can and can't have access to what data for what reasons, who can create data, how often and where it's backed up, how the data should be classified for confidentiality, what's the retention period, how the data is deleted or deactivated, when and how the data is encrypted and masked, what the disaster recovery plan is, and any specifics around any other internal or external controls. So your entire security team this is the one that they're interested in and excited about. Um, so the goals of this phase include developing a risk management strategy, aligning the data back to the controls, making sure you've classified it first, and then saying, okay, it meets this classification, so it needs to meet this level of security control. Um, and then developing procedures for managing the entire life cycle of the data. So during this phase, the owner and the steward determine what governance processes are required to ensure that the data meets the business requirements and the security policies. And we also, we created a, a, a data classification plan as well. And so we've got four different levels of classification and blue, green, yellow, red, I think are the different colors that we've got. And so based on what classification it is, lets you determine what kind of controls you need around it. And then your security knows better how, how best to secure your data. Um, box number seven, uh, it's titled metrics and reporting, but this is not what you do with the data. This again is data about the data. So this is where you put that um, control plan in place that says my data must remain at this level of data quality in order to make it useful for the needs we've defined it for. So um, here, and that should be a few metrics. You shouldn't have hundreds of metrics, um, a few uh, actionable metrics. Um, for the state, in the state of Tennessee, um, we have landed on attack. So if you look at the um, check marked items there, that spells attack sort of. Um, we are measuring our data based on accuracy, timeliness, accessibility, completeness, and consistency. Now there are a couple dozen more ways that we could measure it. Um, these are kind of our, our base starting point. And then depending upon the data that we're putting under governance, we can add more to this. So again, coming into this is gonna be our policies, procedures, standards, and established controls that we have in place. Out of it's going to become those, are, is going to come those data quality metrics. Um, potentially even if you certify um, your data quality levels like you know, gold, bronze, uh, silver, or gold, or things like that. 
um, would come out of that. Um, tools um, you may consider during this particular step, um, a data quality metric definition, um, RCCA process, because if your data goes out of your control plan uh, above or below, um, you would wanna take some action and what are those actions and can those actions actually be automated? Um, the control chart I mentioned, and then uh, potentially a data audit template. Uh, Kim, mm -hmm. how do you measure things like accessibility or consistency? Yeah, so I'll start, I'll take them separately. Accessibility is really uh, through survey mainly. I mean, it's hard to automate that. So you really want to ask folks, can you get to the data you need without involving others or jumping through hoops or manipulating the data? So um, those are like pre-data governance questions and then post-data governance questions and potential ongoing surveys asking folks, can you get to it? Um, Kimberly, I like that you mentioned surveys because sorry. too many times people feel like, Oh, you know, a survey, it's not, you know, uh, quantitative, but that, that's absolutely, that's somebody who does not understand rigorous academic research highly utilizes surveys, and it is a wonderful approach for data governance programs. And I'm stunned how rare when I listen to a case study that people neglect them. So I'm so glad that you utilized them. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Consistency, um, a lot of times you can automate that. That's making sure your data is connected across sources. So yeah, you can definitely automate that and have the exceptions fall out. And then, you know, your data owners or data stewards work those. Thank you. Yep. The final element of data governance is audits. Um, it's important that the data governance process is self audible as well as for fully prepared for any external audits. Uh, the process behind the eight, out of the eight elements of data governance will be fully documented and everything in one place. I like to think about with everything that we talked about in boxes one through seven, putting it in your giant binder. This is my big data governance binder. You know, this is the tab for box one. This is the tab for box six. And then when you get questions, you can just remove pages from your binder. Okay, this is how this is handled. This is how this is handled, that kind of stuff. Of course, everything's digital. It's probably just in a folder on your desktop, but I still like to think about the giant binder. It helps me visualize things. Um, so the purpose of an internal audit is to set up a regularly scheduled audit sketch, uh, audit that data governance processes are being used, data policies are being enforced, and that data quality metrics are being used towards impactful action. Because if you're measuring it, you're not acting on it. Why are you bothering to measure it? Um, so the goals of this phase include working through a self audit process, documenting any gaps in the in the data governance process, addressing those gaps, of course, and then reporting back on the results of those audits. So typically the data owner determines what needs to be audited, what the audit schedule should be, and then they're the ones actually responsible for performing that audit and then reporting back on the results. Um, this making the data owner do that work can remove the curtain from data ownership for them to feel more knowledgeable and have ownership about the data and its process. A lot of times data owners are pretty high up in an organization and they're just like, yeah, yeah, I'm making decisions, I'm important. But if they actually have been in the trenches and better understand what, what's happening, they can feel more trust about it. And really that helps to feel and enable sharing outside of their organization, which is a problem that we've encountered uh, here at the state. So useful templates and tools are gonna to be a maturity assessment template, all the data governance documentation, that giant binder I talked about, and then any evidence storage for, you know, where are you gonna place the, the results of your audits? Can I tell you, when you showed me the framework, and I hate to jump in and prevent Anne-Marie from jumping in, but <laughs> I actually don't, I love doing this. Um, it is rare, I, I can't tell you, if, if I were to look at 20 data governance programs, I doubt that, more than one or two of them have your, your box eight audits. And I love your self audit checklist, your self audit schedule. It is, a, it is a best practice, but it's one I see missed constantly. Can you explain or maybe talk a little bit more about how this has helped your program be successful, not just materially, but even, hey, the biggest problem in doing these programs is the political challenges, getting everyone to play along, 
Can you talk about maybe how this has helped people gain confidence in your program along with do a better job? If you could just give more detail, I think our audience, based on my experience, would get a lot of value out of it. Yeah, I will definitely say, like, I mean, we were the state. We have very regulated uh, data all the time. And so we're constantly being audited by different organizations. And it's a panic every single time. But now that we have this in place, it's super easy. Somebody says, oh my God, hair on fire. How do we know who's got access to all our data? And I'm like, here, let me send it to you. Ta-da, <laughs> problem solved. And that's because we have the data governance in place and we do do absolutely do the self audit because you know we can do a lessons learned after an audit's been completed and like, man we struggled with this part let's make sure this part's better documented or or whatnot yeah so I and definitely think it's good. how frequently do you do the audits the self audits uh so far we're not as often as we should i'll be completely <laughs> i wish we did them more <laughs> the fa i will tell you though the fact you're doing them I am floored. It is a, it, it's a unicorn when you see people doing this. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it shouldn't be. It's standard. I mean, we recommend it all the time, but I, I can't tell you, I, when I saw your framework, this is the one, you can't see my notes here, but I wrote down, I said, they're auditing themselves. That is fantastic. And I would say that the optimal audit frequency is what the data strategy and the data governance program decide is the optimal Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it kind of depends on your data. You know, if it's like Social Security Administration data, you'd probably audit a little more frequently than, you know, if it's, uh, you know, park addresses. State park <laughs> and, and Kim and I, I can tell you, we've actually worked with, with Social Security Administration. I've been out to their headquarters in Baltimore, and uh, they take it really seriously. <laughs> Yes, because they, they are under the microscope. Good thing. Yep. And who participates in your audits? The entire data team, uh, from, from the people who do the reporting, they have things to say to the person doing the audit, all the way up to the data owner who's actually running the audit. And then, of course, myself, that's kind of reviewing and, and holding their hand as they go through this process. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so that's a whole lot of words. Um, it may seem complicated, it's actually not, and it's flexible enough to where you, you have it fit your needs, but um, the real secret behind those eight boxes is there is a guidebook and a playbook. So the guidebook explains in far greater detail than even the words we've given here, you know, what is this, why do I care, why do I want to do that? So this is just a, a picture of guidebook, guidebook's currently 48 pages long. Behind the guidebook, um, there's a playbook. So the playbook is just simply a series of questions behind each one of the eight elements to trigger your thought processes. So it's like under box number one organization, it's gonna say, who's the data owner? <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, and that is that playbook is built with like some key questions, but um, again, flexible to where you may have five more questions you wanna ask for each one of those elements. So kind of a living, breathing document um, that you will use over and over as you go through, um, you know, iterations of this. Here is the um, snapshots of the uh, playbook. We have it in two formats. The first one is a spreadsheet format, and there is a tab for each one of the eight elements. This is where um, there's a description of why are you doing this particular box, who should be involved, um, what your output should be, and then those key questions. Um, and then at the bottom, we have a four page document that ends up being, um, I don't know, eight to 12 pages when you have it filled out. This is that big binder that Amber talked about. So what this document has in it is not all of the answers to all of those questions, but links to the evidence. So when it comes time to audit, you are linking directly to either the documentation, uh, to the metrics, uh, you know, whatever you're, um, you have under governance, um, these are all the links to get back to it, um, to, to prove it. Wow. Uh, challenges, obstacles, and uh, issues. Uh, Amber's gonna um, cover this. This is the results of us piloting this framework uh, at the state. Oh, 
apologize. So this is our actual use case. Um, we decided to pilot the data governance process within our P20 Connect system. So remember, that's our student longitudinal data system that gathers student data from seven different agencies to make that data available for research purposes. Um, so kind of the goals of our initial pilot was to complete the data governance framework and playbook, upload that playbook into our data catalog, which, which again is elation, uh, complete our reference document, that was the Word document, the big binder that we talked about, and then create a repeatable roadmap for other state agencies so we could, we could continue to roll this out across the enterprise. So be because P20 collects data from seven different agencies, that this makes them more far more complex than an average department. Um, however, P20 also has had a data governance coordinator on staff. So they have been doing some data governance activities for the past two years. So while they were more complex than an average department, they were also more data mature than an average department. Um, they already had an existing data governance policy, data governance manual, and a data dictionary. Um, so this did give us a pretty good head start as we worked, walked through the framework with them. So some of our results, just to let you guys know. So this is our progress pretty much as of today. And where we started, just to be perfectly honest, they had the boxes one, two, and three were green and completed. Like I said, they had the committee in place, they had the policies written, the procedures written, written down. They were struggling with box four. So box four was kind of yellow and in progress, but they hadn't even like thought about boxes five through eight yet. So all of that stuff was definitely still red when we started. So we definitely, we added to their existing data dictionary. We found that architecture. Uh, this, this slide is about a month old. So we've actually completed box six at this point. We connected it back to security and classified their data. Um, we're still actively working on the metrics and reporting piece, and we're still actively working on the audit piece. Um, it's, it's, I don't think it's a process that's really ever going to be done as we're continuing to, to make it as good as it can be, I think. Um, so we were able to move more quickly because of the foundational work, because really once you have the policies and procedures in place, uh, everything else follows really easily. Uh, but without those two things, you can circle forever. I absolutely speak from experience. If you don't have the people in place, you're not, you're not going anywhere. So that leads me right into our, our key takeaways. Uh, so the first one is putting the right people in place identifying your data owners, your data stewards, educating them on what that means to be a data owner and a data steward. And then, you know, what are their responsibilities? What are we gonna be asking them of them to do? Because most of these people, I mean, there's no, there's no data steward at the state of Tennessee. There's other people who do data steward activities. It's additional work on top of the job that they already have. So th there's never gonna be an expectation that this is your sole responsibility. And so it's figuring out how do we work? How do we work with them? How do we make them understand that what we're asking them one is not that difficult, not that time consuming, but still very important and needs to be a priority. Uh, the second takeaway was really about, about the weekly assignments. So, you know, as I talked about, there's no one person that's a data steward. They all have other, other work to do. We, we chunked up the work in manageable bite-sized pieces that really allowed the stewards to work on it and then gave us insight much more quickly if the work was not getting done so we could intervene if necessary. You know, you, you throw, you put together this giant spreadsheet and you throw it at your stewards and you say, okay, let, let me know in six months how it's going. Well, they're, they're never going to do that. That's never, ever, ever going to happen. And so we definitely chunked up weekly assignments. Okay, this week we want this work. This week we want this work. And that way we could say, wow, you know, you all over at Department of Education, you haven't done your weekly assignments for the last three weeks. What's going on? Is there a roadblock I can take care of? Or do we need to elevate this and make sure your owner is aware of and they can reprioritize your work? It definitely allowed us to intervene more quickly so we weren't just circling forever, not realizing that the work wasn't getting done. Um, and then that leads me to the third key takeaway, which is really that importance of executive buy-in. The executives are the one who are signing off on the policy. They're approving those data stewards that you've assigned and, and recognize that the work that we're asking their people to do. Um, because without executives that are on board and understand that it's important, it all really does kind of fall apart. If you have someone that says, no, I'm too busy, I can't do this right now. Well, okay, well, I guess, I guess we're done then. I guess we're not gonna move forward. But if you have that executive that says, no, this is a priority, I need you to make this a priority. Well, it, it, poof, it happens. <laughs> Amber, can I jump in with a question for you? Please. In, in working with a lot of big federal client partners, 
This is what, what you just talked about, especially on your key takeaways one and two, getting people to help out is one of the problems. Because, you know, in the corporate world, we get the CDO or the chief marketing officer to come down with a big giant sledgehammer and say, you're going to do this or you're going to lose your job. That doesn't happen in the federal space. Yeah. So, so a lot of times we have to really, we build out things called communities of interest where you get people who are motivated and want to do it. Can you maybe talk about that? Because a state is nothing more than the federal, the same challenges you face federally, except you move the decimal point. That's all you do. Yeah. But it's the same headaches. Can you talk about how you got people to be motivated to play along? Did you do some cool socialization things, whether it's coffee mugs or t-shirts? Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Uh, we have talked about implementing like little badges and saying, you know, what kind of data person you are. We, we haven't done it yet, but it's definitely on the on the roadmap for us. No, mostly we started we started with like the shiny things like the really fancy Tableau dashboards. Ooh, how do I get that? Everybody else has that. Well, you need to do some some foundational work on your data first to really get to that point. Otherwise, those shiny things, they're going to take months and months and you're going to forget you asked for it by the time you got it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of, you know, dangling the, the carrot and it's a little bit of this person's doing, this person's doing, it's a little bit of peer as well. I want to, I want to make sure I'm staying up with my other agencies, staying up with my peers and making sure that we're all, we're all kind of in lockstep together. I don't want to be left behind. And to your point about communities of interest, Amber and I are actually hosting our first data days after this webinar. Oh, <laughs> oh. We, we've got about 80 friends uh, that want to come and hear some stories and share their successes with data. So um, that's, uh, that's going to be great too. Is there an executive steering group that you have? Yeah, we've got a data governance committee. It's a kind of a blend right now of IT folks that represent the agencies plus um, uh, folks actually business folks out of the agencies. Um, it is sponsored by the state CIO and deputy CIO. May I recommend as people are listening in, steal, don't borrow, steal some of these concepts, data days. What a great, I, I've actually had a couple client partners use data days as oh, one yeah. of their, so use this stuff. It's great marketing. You hear how Kim, Kim mentioned, hey, we're having people share their success stories Fantastic. And Amber, you, you hit on a point that's near and dear to my heart. All these fancy visualizations do not mean a thing when the data is inaccurate and we don't understand it. No, none of them are relevant because the data would be flawed, incorrect, or we don't even know what they mean. So excellent. I'm going to be quiet and let you guys continue <laughs> on the presentation. Um, so in summary, um, you know, these are the eight elements that we're, we're practicing and um, right now, we're replicating this framework across the state, kind of agency by agency, department by department. Um, you know, Amber and I are two people, and we have a lot of other really fun data things to work on. So we have contracted with a cons local consulting firm, um, uh, Silex, to uh, learn this. So Amber and I have taught them, and then we became the students, and they taught us back. And now they are engaging with the agencies. Um, although Amber and I will stay involved, you know, in the daily standups and to help remove any blockers in their progress. But um, that's our, our plan to get it out faster. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's, it's going to take years to, uh, to get it across the state. Um, just to reinforce, chances are you're already governing data informally. Um, there's a book by Robert Siner called Non-Invasive Data Governance. Um, what, what we're finding, just like uh, you will probably find as well, is if you remove all of the fire drills you do when it comes audit time and you kind of put folks in more of a structured process flow, um, you're going to actually save time in doing this. So you don't have to add extra people to the team. Um, chances are people are doing this in some fashion, um, but to maybe just not in a coordinated fashion. So that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, reach out to me um, directly. I'm happy to share. Uh, we have questions. We oh. actually have 10 questions. Okay, let's so go. I don't know if we're going to get to all of them, but here goes. 
for support and sponsorship. Were you able to get people to agree to the roles and the responsibilities? And did you have any executive level sponsors? Uh, yes, the, sh the short answer is yes, but it, it takes a little while. You really have to sell it to the executives to to identify those people because you, you know you can you can try to make the the middle mid level people understand and they might get on board, but without the executives saying yes, this is priority, uh, then then like like I said, it doesn't move forward. And so you do have to do a little bit of a, a sales and marketing pitch to them. Mm -hmm. um, what was the highest level of position in each department that was involved in the data governance program? The person asked, is the governor involved? Is your general counsel involved? Uh, not quite to that level. We have the chief operating officer. She's involved in, uh, to, to a degree. And then otherwise, we, when you get actually down in, in each department with commissioners are the top and then deputy and associate, we have usually, occasionally it's a commissioner. Usually it's a deputy commissioner that's involved. OK. Um, how successful have you been in having the data governance and data stewardship responsibilities included in individuals' duty statements? Yeah, so like I said, or Kim referenced, we've got those IPPs, individual performance plans. Those are kind of our year yearly reviews that we do here at the state. Some agencies have implemented them to great success. Not all agencies have implemented them yet. So that's still something that we're actively rolling out uh, and we'll let you know in a year or so how it went. <laughs> Um, we have a question about, actually we have two questions about architecture. Uh, one, would you separate the various architectures when you're doing the architecture stage between business, data, technology, et cetera, or would you just combine architecture all together? I, I keep them separated and then I usually build them at varying degrees. So you could have a very high level business process map that just shows data flowing from department to department, take it down a layer. Now you're down department system, take it down a layer. And then I do the same thing on the technology side. So very high level, you know, here's the data sets and then you might get down to databases, tables, things like that. Have you integrated the framework into commercially uh, available software? Have you done this through your use with Relation or something else? I don't understand. Okay. Um, the question was, has this framework been integrated into any software tools yet? No. Um, actually, I hear there's a book coming out, but uh, outside of that. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, stay tuned for that. Um, and... We have several people posing the question, are any of the policy documentation, playbooks, publicly available content and on the agent and on your state website? Uh, not yet, because part of the data strategy is to create a state public facing website. Um, but if you reach out to me, I can share them with you. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, for those of you who, the several of you who asked that question, Kim's uh, email address is on the screen as we speak. Um, how do you encourage people to participate with your day to days or other activities? Do you have rewards? Do you have awards? Do you have threats, intimidation? Right now, so I typically, at other places I've worked, I bribe. So cookies, coffee, um, giveaways from mm -hmm. vendors. Um, you know, door prizes of data. I love data t-shirts, things like that. But since we're all remote and the state kind of has different regulations around that kind of uh, reward systems, yes. um, Amber and I are just like cheerleaders. So like over the top, like you are going to be so missing out. This is, <laughs> uh, I can't believe you're, you can't come. Like this is going to be amazing. This data days or this data governance committee meeting or whatever like you just uh not you know data isn't the most exciting topic for a lot of people uh unless you're like amber and i and you too um so we just we we just gotta uh, act so excited that we're just you know over the top about it and we found that out with working with other states and with federal government the impetus to reward provide awards for participation has to be subjective. It has to be uh, influential and persuasive. We, you can't give out stuff. It's not no. allowed. Um, right. 
although giving out stuff can be a big attraction, you have to find other ways to do it. Right. Um, did all the departments have a vested interest in making this work? Did they all buy into it? So far, they have um, verbally, like I said, I hosted mm -hmm. the, um, you know, data strategy meeting workshops. These were 90 minute workshops with each agency um, back last summer and fall. Uh, and this came to the top of everyone. So, you know, the fact that they already knew this was a gap <laughs> and we're calling it data governance, I was like, yes, this is awesome. Um, so, uh, but then, you know, there's that element of, okay, now somebody has to do the work and uh, we're just, you know, starting to get into those. So we'll, uh, we can circle back around at some point and, and let you know how the execution piece goes. Okay, and that's what someone asked about your dream state. And we don't mean dream Tennessee, dream state of data governance. Oh, dream state. So we've got a couple of mantras. Um, uh, one of them is um, better data, better access, better decisions. This is the tagline we have in our Alation data catalog. So every person that goes in there each day gets that uh, affirmation uh, in front of them. Um, but primarily our goal is self-serve quality data. So depending upon where you're at and what you're working on, your definition of self-serve could be different and your definition of quality data can be different, but that's, that's the idea. Okay. Um... Let me finish. That answer is done. Who developed the policies and procedures? Uh, I did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a quick answer. And um, did you find that your success during this process created internal champions? Absolutely. Yes. Once, once they get it, once they see the value that they're getting out of it, then they go and talk to other people and say, man, this is, this is working for us. Everybody should do this. Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, somebody asked the difference between a steering committee and a data governance council. I think it's the same thing. The council in the past, my council has really been at the exec level across the board. Um, with the steering committee being more down at the data owner level, but um, they could be the one and the same. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take back control so we can conclude. Share screen. Hello. Welcome back. To Kim and Amber, thank you. The number of people who wrote into the chat, what an excellent presentation this has been. I stopped counting. <laughs> it thank stopped you, at everybody. about 25, and I just decided I would not count any further. Um, I would like to talk about our next presentation. The smiling face of David Marco reappears because on Thursday, March 25th, we're going to talk about a topic that is near and dear to David's heart since he wrote the two best-selling books on metadata management. We're going to take the webinar series to a new topic. We're going to start looking at metadata management. So join us on Thursday, March 25th at noon central US time. And we will hear from, as I said, the world's foremost authority on metadata management. You can register now at the ewsolutions.com slash data management webinars website. Same place you register for this one. I'd like to thank our sponsors for today's presentation capabilities. I really would like to thank everyone who attended. And I'd like to thank for the last time for today, Kim and Amber. Thank you for As having we, us. Oh, you're quite welcome. As we've mentioned before, the webinar recording and slides are available on the EW Solutions website on datamanagementu.com as well. And if you registered for the session, you will get a confirming email about it. 
if you attended the whole session, and if you're still here, you are still attending, you'll receive a certificate. If you're interested in studying about data governance, please visit datamanagementeducation.com. We have a course in data governance mastery, certified course. Excellent, if I do say so myself. And if you have not subscribed to the newsletter, you're not getting notice of all our events, articles, webinars, videos, etc. Please go to datamanagementu.com and subscribe. It's free. Who doesn't love free? And you'll be part of this community formally. Thank you all for attending. If you have a case study you would like to share, please let us know and we'll set up a discussion. For now, Kim and Amber, we expect you back. Love to. We expect Thank you. To talk about the playbook in more detail and the processes that you mentioned. I'd love to. Have a wonder wonderful rest of your day, evening, and week. Bye. Bye, everyone.